Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology 2. So today we're going to begin to talk about gas exchange and VQ or ventilation perfusion relationships. So remember, this is The Great Adventure, and uh, this is our series. So we're on the second uh, um, lecture here. Um, and we want to approach this like a kid in a candy shop. So today we'll be talking about gas exchange and VQ. Calculating alveolar PCO2, calculating alveolar PO2, or the alveolar air equation, and then how to calculate arterial PO2 and arterial PCO2, and we'll start that and um, kind of continue that next time. And then we're going to just talk briefly about cyanosis. So first, gas exchange and VQ. The alveolus is obviously where gas exchange occurs. So oxygen comes in by ventilation. It diffuses across the alveolar capillary membrane into the blood. Conversely, CO2 comes from the body through the blood, diffuses out into the alveolus where it's ventilated out. So if we just think about oxygen first, the amount of oxygen coming in is related to ventilation. Remember, we talked about the fact that you need adequate ventilation, adequate perfusion, um, ability of O2 and CO2 to, to fuse across the alveolar capillary membrane, and distribution of ventilation in order to have adequate gas exchange, but the most important one of these is distribution of ventilation, at least clinically. So here's an example. Let's assume that we have an adequate amount of ventilation, so five liters per minute of rest, an adequate cardiac output or amount of perfusion, five liters per minute of rest, oxygen and CO2 diffuse across the alveolar capillary membrane, but in this example, none of the ventilation goes where the blood flow goes. Ventilation does not go where perfusion goes. So even though these are adequate, and this is uh, also adequate, no gas exchange occurs. So this is an extreme example of the problems with abnormal distribution of ventilation. Back to our alveolus here. Gas exchange occurs when oxygen comes in, CO2 goes out. Ventilation is the amount of air breathed in and out of the lungs. So that's ventilation. And by convention, the amount of ventilation is quantitated by measuring exhaled air, so it's abbreviated VE. Now, the reason for this is historic, and that is before we had computers, if we wanted to measure gas exchange, we collected exhaled air. So you can see through this uh, one-way valve here, uh, you breathe in here, and then you breathe out and into, in this case, a Douglas bag, which collected all of the exhaled air, and then you might do whatever calculations you want to do on there in that Douglas bag. So it was literally exhaled uh, minute ventilation or exhaled volume. So VE, minute ventilation, is the respiratory rate times the size of each breath or frequency times tidal volume and often abbreviated in this sort of way. VT being tidal volume, the size of each breath, and VE, minute ventilation, which in this case is exhaled. Oxygen comes in by ventilation. Blood flow, our oxygen is removed by blood flow. So basically, how do we figure out the concentration of oxygen in this alveolus? It's basically going to be a dynamic equilibrium between the amount of oxygen that comes in by ventilation and the amount that's removed by perfusion. Okay, and this is referred to as VQ. Um, so V for ventilation, Q because it's the first letter in the alphabet after P, which stands for perfusion. Actually, I have no idea why they used Q, but Q is the number for perfusion. So the amount coming in by ventilation versus the amount going out is going to give you the concentration or fraction of oxygen in this alveolus. So just to make things very simple, alveolar O2 is a dynamic equilibrium determined by the amount going in versus the amount going out. The amount going in is determined by ventilation. The amount going out is determined by perfusion. And so the alveolar O2 concentration is a dynamic equilibrium determined by the ratio of ventilation to perfusion or VQ. Similarly, the alveolar CO2 concentration is a dynamic equilibrium determined by the amount going in versus the amount going out. The amount going in to the alveolus is determined by the metabolic rate, which is a constant and perfusion, or Q. The amount going out is determined by ventilation. That is, it's basically diluted by ventilation. So that alveolar CO2 is inversely proportional 
to the ratio of ventilation to perfusion, inversely proportional. Right? So this is what we get when we get normal values. Mixed venous PO2, that is the amount of oxygen in blood returning to the lungs, is 40. Alveolar, normal alveolar O2 is 100. Diffusion occurs, oxygen occur, goes into the blood, and the end capillary O2 is around 100. CO2, more highly diffusible than oxygen. Mixed venous PCO2 coming in is 46. Diffusion occurs into the alveolus, which has a normal PCO2 of 40, and the end capillary CO2 leaving also has a PCO2 uh, of 40. If the normal VQ ratio is 1, that is for most uh, adults sitting at rest, they have a minute ventilation of about 5 to 6 liters per minute, have a normal cardiac output of about 5 to 6 liters per minute, so 5 to 6 divided by 5 to 6 is 1, so the normal VQ ratio is 1. And these are the normal values we get. We get a PO2 of 100 and a PCO2 of 40. So if the normal VQ is 1, there are only two possible types of VQ abnormalities. You can have a VQ greater than 1 or a VQ less than 1. So if you have a VQ greater than 1, you have more oxygen coming in, less being removed, so the alveolar oxygen is going to be greater than the normal value of 100. Similarly, you have less CO2 coming in and more being removed, so the PCO2 is going to be less than the normal value. So for VQ ratios less than 1, it's the opposite. We have less oxygen coming in, more being removed, so the P alveolar O2 is going to be lower than normal or lower than 100. PCO2, you have normal coming in, less being removed, so the PCO2 will be greater than 40 or greater than the normal value. So that's basically gas exchange. If you understand this, you understand how VQ affects oxygen and CO2. So let's just take extreme examples for a moment, because if we know what the VQ ratio is, we can have some idea what the alveolar O2 and CO2 is. So let's start with the VQ ratio greater, uh, of infinity, which would be the extreme case of a ventilated alveolus but no blood flow. All right, so here, inspired oxygen, remember P inspired O2 is 150 at sea level. None is being removed, so the alveolar PO2 is going to be 150. For CO2, none comes in, so it doesn't matter how much is removed, so the PCO2 is going to be zero. The closer the VQ ratio is to one, but still greater than one, the closer the P alveolar O2 will be to 100, but greater than 100, and the closer the PC, uh, P alveolar CO2 will be to 40, but less than 40. So I think you can get an idea here that depending on what the VQ ratio is, it's going to determine what these PO2s and PCO2s are. Conversely, for a VQ ratio, decreased VQ ratio, the extreme case would be a VQ ratio of zero. So let's say we have a lung that is not ventilated, but is perfused. And let's just look at this in the acute situation for a moment. Let's assume that I'm eating a donut and aspirate it into my right main stem bronchus. So instantly there'll be no ventilation, and therefore the, the PO2 and PCO2 values are going to be equal to what came into the lung in mixed venous PO2. So it'll be a PO alveolar O2 of 40, PO alveolar CO2 of 46. As time goes on, however, right, with this blood coming through and no ventilation occurring, oxygen will get even lower and CO2 will get even higher. So somewhat like the situation of increased VQ, for situations where the VQ ratio is less than one, the closer the VQ ratio is to one, the closer the PO2 will be to 100, but less than 100. And, and the closer the VQ ratio is to one, the closer the PCO2 will be to 40, but greater than 40. And then the closer the VQ ratio is to zero, the lower the PO2 will be and the higher the PCO2, even above these numbers. How can we calculate alveolar CO2? Um, I'm going to go through uh, basically a way to calculate this, which I don't think you need to remember because we're going to come up with a much simpler way to do this, but I just want to prove to you that we in fact can do this. Calculating alveolar PCO2. So CO2 is produced at a constant rate by the body's metabolic rate. CO2 comes to the alveolus by perfusion, and CO2 is removed from the alveolus by ventilation. However, not all ventilation takes part in gas exchange. 
So if we look at total minute ventilation, VE, it is equal to alveolar ventilation, which is ventilation that takes part in gas exchange, and wasted ventilation, VD, which is ventilation that does not take part in gas exchange. And most of this in normal individuals would be conducting airways with a volume of about 2 mLs per kilogram of body weight. If we want to know what the fraction of alveolar CO2 is, what's the concentration of CO2 in this alveolus? It's going to be CO2 production, that's coming in the alveolus, divided by alveolar ventilation. All right. So in a normal 70 kilogram man at rest, uh, CO2 production is 200 mLs a minute. Minute ventilation is about 5 liters per minute. Alveolar ventilation is about 70% of that, so let's say 3.6 liters per minute. And therefore, the fraction of alveolar CO2 is going to be 0.2 liters, 200 mLs per minute, divided by 3.6 or 5.5%. We can convert this to pCO2 by multiplying by barometric pressure minus 47 times the fraction of alveolar CO2. And when we do that, it gives us a pCO2 of 40. In the normal situation for a ventilation round 5, perfusion round 5, VQ of 1, P alveolar CO2 is 40 tor, or 40 millimeters of mercury. We can do this for other VQ ratios. Let's look at a VQ ratio of 1 half. So for VQ ratio of 1 half, ventilation is going to be only half normal, 2.5. Alveolar ventilation will be 70% of that, 1.8. So 0.2 divided by 1.8 is 11.1%. And when we convert that to pCO2, we get 80. So here, ventilation was half normal. pCO2 is twice normal, inversely related. If we look at a VQ ratio of 2, so now ventilation, CO2 production is still 200. A minute ventilation is twice normal, 70% of that, 7.2. Fraction of alveolar CO2, 0.2 divided by 7.2 or 2.8%. We convert that to pCO2, and that's going to be 20. So this was twice normal. This is half normal. Again, reciprocal relationships. So the key here is that alveolar CO2, or arterial CO2, is inversely proportional to alveolar ventilation. So here was the normal situation where you had a minute ventilation of 5 and a pCO2 of 40. If you decrease ventilation, CO2 rises exponentially. If you increase ventilation, CO2 falls exponentially along this curve. What's the easy way to do this? So we know that pCO2 equals 40 when VQ is 1. CO2 is inversely proportional to VQ. So the alveolar pCO2 equals 40 divided by VQ. Simple. If VQ equals 2, Alveolar CO2 is 40 divided by 2, or 20. That's what we calculated just a minute ago. If VQ race is 1 half, pCO2 is 40 divided by 1 half, or 80. And again, that's what we just calculated about a minute ago. So if we wanted to increase pCO2, all right, uh, the way we could do it would be to increase CO2. Well, sorry, we usually want to decrease pCO2. We could decrease CO2 production, but that would be decreasing metabolic rate and putting somebody into shock. We could increase alveolar ventilation or increase VQ. So how do we calculate P alveolar O2? And this is the alveolar air equation. And I can tell you that for pulmonary fellows in the audience, uh, this will be on your pulmonary board exams. Uh, one or more questions about the alveolar air equation. So let's just look at this. So oxygen is consumed at a constant rate by the body's metabolic rate. O2 comes to the alveolus, however, by ventilation. However, again, not all ventilation takes part in gas exchange, and O2 is removed from the alveolus by perfusion. So it comes in that way. In normal resting man, minute ventilation is 5. Alveolar ventilation, about 70% of that. Fraction inspired oxygen is 21%. So the amount of oxygen entering the alveolus per minute is alveolar ventilation times FiO2. Okay, so 3.6 times 0.21 is in fact 0.76. So there are 0.76 liters per minute entering the alveoli of somebody at rest. Okay.
However, again, not all oxygen is consumed. Oxygen consumption is 250 mL per minute. So the oxygen in the, that's in the alveolus is the amount entering minus the amount leaving. So in this case, oxygen in the alveolus would be 0.76, the amount coming in, minus 0.25, the amount being consumed, or 0.51. Alveolar ventilation is 3.6 liters per minute. So fraction of alveolar oxygen is going to be oxygen in the alveolus, which we've now calculated is 0.51, divided by alveolar ventilation, or 14%. We can convert that to P alveolar O2 by multiplying by barometric pressure, minus 47 times alveolar fraction. So that's 760 minus 47 times 0.14, and that's about 100. So for the normal situation, again, adults at rest, minute ventilation 5, blood flow or cardiac output at 5, VQ1. When VQ is 1, the alveolar O2 is 100, approximately 100. Okay? So if we look at different VQs, VQ ratio 1 half means that minute ventilation will be decreased. Again, 70% is about 1.8. So here we have uh, oxygen consumption. So amount in the alveolus is the amount coming in, all right, minus the amount removed. In this case, 0.13 liters. All right. Um, so the fraction of alveolar oxygen is going to be the amount um, in the alveolus divided by alveolar ventilation, excuse me. So that's going to give you 7.2% or a P alveolar O2 of 51. Um, so ventilation here was about half normal. Fraction and the PO2 are about half normal. If we look at VQ ratio 2, minute ventilation is increased. Um, O2 consumption is still the same. The amount in the alveolus is VA times FiO2, which is 1.26 divided by alveolar ventilation is going to be 17.5% or about one and a quarter normal. P alveolar O2 is going to be 125. So this was twice normal. This is up. It's about one and a quarter normal. So this is not linear related. It's not like CO2 where there's a direct inverse relationship. It's not quite a direct linear relationship. If we want to increase alveolar O2, which is what we want to do, we could decrease O2 consumption, but that's not something we want to do, put someone in shock. We could increase alveolar ventilation, increase VQ, or in this case, we could increase the partial pressure of inspired oxygen by FiO2, and all of these would increase the P alveolar O2. So the alveolar air equation. So the alveolar air equation basically says that the P alveolar O2 is the amount of oxygen coming in minus the amount of oxygen coming out okay now we can measure the amount coming in and we in fact in fact know that that's the p inspired o2 how about the amount being removed so oxygen that is consumed okay we can calculate all right so the r ratio is co2 production divided by o2 consumption so if we know alveolar co2 and divided by R, we're dividing by CO2 divided by O2. The CO2s cancel and we get O2 up here. This turns out to be the amount of oxygen consumed or the amount of oxygen removed. Normal value for RQ is 0.8. That's what's always used. So this is the alveolar air equation. Alveolar PO2 equals PiO2, inspired, okay, minus P alveolar CO2 divided by 0.8. Okay, pretty simple. Right. It's not rocket science. For VQ ratio of 1, let's just look at this. PCO2 is 40 divided by VQ. 40 divided by 1 is 40. Alveolar air equation, PiO2, PCO2 divided by 0.8. PiO2 is 150. The uh, PCO2 is 40 divided by 0.8, that's 50. So the P alveolar O2 is 100. That's just the same thing that we got when we calculated this out. Um, using physiology. VQ ratio one half. So PCO2 is 40 divided by one half, or 80. P alveolar O2 is going to be PiO2 uh, minus PCO2 divided by 0 0.8, or 150 divided by 80 over 0 0.8, which is 100. And that gives you an alveolar O2 of 50. Again, the same value we got when we calculated this out the long way. 
finally a VQ ratio of 2. PCO2 is going to be 40 divided by VQ, or 2 is 20. Alveolar air equation, 150 minus 20 divided by 0.8. That's going to be 25. So 50 minus 25 is 125. Again, exactly the same value that we got calculating this out the long way. In the alveolus, there is another gas that we haven't talked about, which is nitrogen. Nitrogen takes up 79% of the volume of the gas. But that means that remaining 21% is shared between oxygen and CO2. So if you have more oxygen, for example, you have to have less CO2. If you have more CO2, you have to have less oxygen. So these two basically fill up that alveolus in terms of the sum has to be constant. But um, how this is distributed, of course, can vary. This brings us back to our original diagram here. So this really is gas exchange. This is the fundamental of gas exchange. Gas exchange is determined by VQ. So for VQ ratio of 1, the normal situation, P alveolar O2 is 100, P alveolar CO2 is 40. VQ greater than 1, P alveolar O2 is going to be greater than normal, P CO2 is going to be less than normal. For VQ less than 1, the usual situation in clinical disease, the P alveolar O2 is going to be less than normal and the P alveolar CO2 is going to be greater than normal. So again, just looked at this way, increased VQ, increased oxygen, decreased CO2, decreased VQ, decreased oxygen, increased CO2. However, the alveolar air equation only calculates alveolar O2 assuming a uniform distribution of ventilation. Similarly, the calculation of PCO2 by VQ assumes a uniform distribution of ventilation. But unfortunately, nobody's lungs have a completely uniform distribution of, uh, distribution of ventilation. So how do regional differences in gas exchange affect arterial blood gases? Arterial blood gases, of course, are the amount of oxygen going to the tissues to provide oxygenation of the tissues. How do we calculate arterial PO2 and arterial PCO2? We were concerned before about alveolar values. We're now talking about our trip. Let's examine a two-compartment lung. Now, the truth of the matter is that the lung probably has hundreds, maybe thousands, of lung units of different VQ that all mix to cause um, arterial um, values. But let's just take a very simplistic example. Let's take a normal individual who has uniform distribution of ventilation, 2.5 liters per minute to this lung, 2.5 liters per minute to this lung, 2.5 liters per minute of perfusion in this lung and to this lung. So that's perfectly uniform. Okay. The general principle in terms of calculating PR2 O2 and PR2 CO2 is that these are determined by the oxygen and CO2 coming from many lung units with different VQ ratios. So how do we calculate these? The general principle is that the content of arterial blood is the mean content of in capillary blood from each lung or each lung unit. And similarly, the content of arterial oxygen CO2 or arterial CO2 is the mean and capillary CO2 for each lung or lung unit. For CO2, turns out that CO2 content and PCO2 are linear in the physiologic range, so we can just work with PCO2. P arterial CO2 is going to equal the amount of blood flow to the right, let's say we have a two compartment lung, times the PCO2 to, in the right, plus the blood flow to the left times the PCO2 in the left, all divided by the total blood flow. All right. Or it's the average PCO2 coming from all of these units. Remember, in the physiologic range, PCO2 is linearly related to CO2 content. CO2 is a little bit more complex, and unfortunately, O2 content and PO2 are not linear, okay? And therefore, we have to use the end capillary O2 content of each lung to calculate arterial O2 content. But most oxygen is carried on hemoglobin. So one can substitute saturation of hemoglobin for content. So the saturation of arterial oxygen, okay, the hemoglobin for arterial oxygen, is going to be equal to the blood flow of the right, times the saturation from the right, plus blood flow on the left, plus saturation from the left, 
all divided by total blood flow, or again, the average of many young lung units of saturation. And then we use the oxyhemoglobin association group to back calculate P arterial O2. If we had a saturation here, we'll just go down the curve to get what that PO2 was. All right, so let's look at how this works. So in this situation, we have a VQ ratio of one on this side. So we know what these values are already. We don't have to go through it. We're going to have PCO2 of 40, uh, PO2 of 100, and therefore a SAT of 100. Likewise, over here, exactly the same thing. These two merge, if you will. They mix. So half the blood is 40, half the blood is 40. That's going to give you PCO2 of 40. In this case, it's the content of blood. So if you look at saturation, half the saturation is 100, half the saturation is 100. So the saturation of arterial blood will be 100. Now, there's another little number up here that we haven't talked about yet. This is the alveolar to arterial oxygen difference, or the difference between alveolar PO2 and arterial O2. And notice it's very low. It's only one, right? So this is the alveolar to arterial oxygen difference, not uncommonly written delta AAO2, that is the AO2 gradient. Um, it's going to be equal to the alveolar air equation, right, to calculate alveolar O2 minus the measured P arterial O2. So this is important because it helps us to identify the source of hypoxia. A normal value is definitely less than 20, and it's going to be normal in hypoventilation or uniformly decreased VQ. Anything that's a uniform process, obstructive sleep apnea is not different in different parts of the lung. Congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, hypoventilation throughout the lung. Uh, narcotic overdose, hypoventilation. It's going to be the same throughout the lung. Okay, So the AO2 gradient will be normal in that situation. It will be increased when there's non-uniform regional de um, units of decreased VQ. And even more so in right to left shunts, and even more so if you breathe uh, supplemental oxygen. So a high AAO2 gradient correlates with intrapulmonary pathology, all right? Regional abnormalities in VQ, right to left shunts. And if you add supplemental oxygen, you make that even higher. Low AAO2 gradients are global hypoventilation or uniformly decreased VQ for whatever reason. This is actually technically the normal range for AAO2 gradient, but in children, we're often down in this range. All right, so let's look at an example of hypoventilation. In this case, that is uniform. So this person now is breathing one and a half liters per minute, not two and a half liters per minute, but blood flow is the same, 2.5 on each side. The VQ ratio, therefore, is going to be 0.6, 1.5 divided by 2.5 on both sides. If you look at this, for VQ ratio 0.6, we're going to get a PCO2 of 67, 40 divided by 0.6. And then alveolar air equation gives us a PO2 of 66, all right? We get the same over here because VQ is the same here. So we get a PCO2 of 67 on each side. It averages to 67. We go to O2 sat, 90 on this side, 90 on this side, going to be 90, and we get a PO2 of 63, okay? Again, in this situation, note that the AO2 gradient is low because this was a uniform process. So the AAO2 gradient is low when we have a uniform hypoventilation, right? So the resulting blood gas here, uniform decrease in ventilation, is elevated PCO2, decreased PAO2, but a normal AAO2 gradient. All right, uh, we're going to come back to this topic next time and look at regional differences, but I just want to quickly mention cyanosis. So you all probably recognize cyanosis as a blue color in the lips, um, tongue, fingers, et cetera. Um, so this blue color seen in the lips, fingernails, is associated with hypoxia, that is a decreased PO2. But actually, it's seen when there are five grams per deciliter of unsaturated hemoglobin. Now, a normal um, venous O2 uh, saturation is 75%. And a normal hemoglobin is about 14 grams per deciliter. So that means that only 25% of that, or 3.5 grams per deciliter, 
are unsaturated in venous blood, and you will not observe cyanosis. By the way, the, um, the blood that is perfusing the skin that you see is primarily venous. Okay? So that's because here's our physiologic working rates. Now let's say that somebody has lung disease. And let's say that uh, this results in hypoxia and saturation will be reduced. So let's assume that this individual has a P arterial O2 of less than 60. Therefore, saturation will be less than 89. Let's assume that we still have a normal arterial to venous saturation difference of 25%. That means that the venous O2 perfusing skin will be less than 64. And if we, uh, this is going to be our physiologic working range here now. So lower arterial and lower venous values. So if we do the math for a normal hemoglobin of 14, a venous saturation of less than 64 will cause greater than five grams of unsaturated hemoglobin and cyanosis will be observed. All right. Now, cyanosis is not a perfect sign. It may not be seen in anemia. That is, if somebody has uh, anemia, even if they're hypoxic, there may not be enough hemoglobin to have greater than five grams unsaturated. On the other hand, there is a rare disease called polycythemia rubra vera, where hemoglobin is increased. Okay, uh, It's also increased in individuals who are residents of very high altitude, uh, who have chronic mountain sickness. They, both of these groups can have hemoglobin as high as 20 grams per deciliter. Now, if you have a hemoglobin as high as 20, 25% of that is five, and you will appear cyanotic even if you're normo normoxemic. So keep in mind that cyanosis is due to a certain number of grams of unsaturated hemoglobin perfusing the skin, um, and it is a useful sign if you see it, but it's not necessarily perfect and may be absent in some patients who are hypoxic if they have anemia. All right, so let's summarize what we talked about today. P alveolar O2 and P alveolar CO2 are determined by VQ. P alveolar CO2 indicates the adequacy of ventilation and is inversely proportional to VQ and alveolar ventilation. P alveolar O2 is determined by the amount of O2 coming into the alveolus coming out. So that's the alveolar air equation. So the quick way to, to calculate CO2 is 40 divided by VQ. And then the alveolar air equation is going to be alveolar PO2 equals PiO2, 150 at sea level, minus CO2 divided by 0.8. P arterial O2 and P arterial CO2 are the average in capillary CO2 and O2 and CO2 from many lung units with many different VQ ratios. The AAO2 gradient is normal with a uniform process, but is increased with non-uniform distribution of ventilation, and especially with a right to life shunt. Cyanosis is seen when there are greater than five grams per deciliter of unsaturated hemoglobin in venous blood. And again, this summarizes the whole thing. VQ ratio of one gives you these values. VQ ratio greater than one, increased oxygen, decreased CO2. VQ ratio less than one, decreased oxygen and in increased CO2. So this is the basics of gas exchange. We're going to fine tune that with a little more detail next time. But this really is the basics of gas exchange. Next time, we're going to talk about gas exchange in VQ number two. I want to thank again our director and producer, Dr. Catherine Winter. Thank you so much for joining me.